I wanted to talk a little bit now about um, the portfolio generally, but also some of the achievements this year. We've had a very good year. We've had a very good couple of years, um, which is great, but I wanted to talk specifically about some of the milestones. And we'll, we'll see shortly that seven seems to be our magic number this year. Um, Malcolm mentioned five, uh, or sorry, uh, we've had seven new investments this year. We'll talk about a few of them. Three of them have yet not yet been announced, so we're not going to name them specifically, but look for them shortly. And Malcolm mentioned um, five exits. If we look at the partial exits we've had this year as well, we've had seven. And you might recall that we've had, um, until the VCT rule changes, we've had a strategy of our debt team investing the nil earning cash into debt to make the money work harder. We've had an 11.5% IRR on those debt deals and a 40% blended average IRR on the equity exits this year. Um, we've had seven follow-on investments. Uh, I'll talk about them a little bit more, but including some significant follow-on into Bliss and In Context. Um, and we have seven portfolio companies with an annual revenue run rate over 25 million, some significantly larger, like Watchfinder, who we'll be speaking later, who are on a 100 million run rate. Um, and then, all of a sudden, I have to show four instead of seven. But we've had four companies that were featured in the Sunday Times, either Tech Track or Top Track 100 this year. So it's been quite a good year. Um, I just wanted to quickly remind you of the 42 portfolio companies that you are invested in. Um, they're primarily UK-based businesses, but with a very global footprint. So this is where those companies trade outside of the UK. Um, wanted to talk a little bit about some of the things happening in the market. And um, one of the hot topics is probably Brexit. Brexit has... Um, fallen a bit flat for us and that there has been obviously a lot of speculation, a lot of worry, a lot of concern. This year for us and for our competitors, we haven't really seen a significant impact, which doesn't mean we won't see a significant impact, but it hasn't um, shown itself this year. One of the key considerations on a forward basis, um, the EIF, the European Investment Fund, um, is a significant investor of funds in the UK. Uh, depending on where you look, 12 to 20% of UK venture and early stage funds were cornerstoned by the EIF. That's a significant number in itself, but the EIF's view is that they are an early investor that helps unlock more of the private sector money. Um, and their view is that that early stage investment actually unlocked 2.9 billion in early stage investments in funds in 2014. So that would be quite a significant amount of money if the EIF is no longer able to act as a cornerstone investor. For us, that's both good and bad. It's obviously better when we have more money in the market because it makes it a more attractive place to start companies and to invest. On the other hand, that means there could be a lot less competition for new deals in the market. Um, so that's something that could be coming down the pipe. Um, one of the other considerations for us is cross-border transactions and also our portfolio companies operating in multiple countries. When we think about the portfolio, for us, we're more likely to be expanding to the US than necessarily to the EU, so there's a little bit of a risk mitigation there. Um, but even so, um, the WTO uh, provides that um, software companies or cloud-based companies trading through from country to country are not subject to the same tariffs that other physical goods businesses would be. So when we look at new businesses, that's obviously a point of interest for us. Um, Generally in the market, uh, large-scale M&A is at an all-time low. However, on the VC side of the market, um, the last quarter had more um, deals, both in terms of number of deals and level of investment, than the same time last year. So what that means for us is that the VC market is quite hot. There are a lot of deals that we're seeing. And indeed, the number of deals in deal flow this year is twice as much as it was this time last year. And they're good quality deals. But it does mean we have to be cognizant of the exit market. And for us, quite a lot of the follow-on investments, as we'll talk about, and even some of the exits, we're looking to the US for. Um, in terms of other general trends, valuations is a question we often get asked. Valuations in the US are coming down, but we're seeing a lag in that. So the valuations and the prices that we're looking at incoming companies on are still relatively high in our view. However, we're seeing um, early signs that the valuations are coming down. In part, we're seeing a lot of flat rounds, so at the same price as the previous round. And we're also seeing companies that turned us down on pricing coming back to ask us if that deal is still valid. Um, so we do see some movement, but prices are still relatively high. Um, we, um, syndication is another key theme in the market right now. So what we're seeing is that many companies are being funded at a significantly higher amount of money earlier in their lifespans which means the companies are growing a lot faster, but it also means that there's quite a bit of um, money taking a, a relatively risky position. We tend to follow that money, 
But because the early check size was big, that means the next check size is also going to be big. So we're looking to do a lot more syndication with other VCs and our peers in the market. Um, uh, corporate venturing is another area that's of interest for us. So corporate venturing as a whole in the UK is at 28% of all new venture deals funded this year. That's at an all-time high. For us, we've seen it as a theme across a variety of portfolio companies that we'll talk about, but including Bliss and In Context. And then we are often asked about what sectors we look at. Um, we do, at the beginning of each year, go through the process of looking at what sectors are hot. And at the moment, it continues to be things like um, fintech, um, prop tech or property technology is still of interest. Cybersecurity is still quite hot. Artificial intelligence and machine learning is certainly um, a hot area. But we tend to keep finding that we ultimately invest in the teams and the product. So established management teams have a good track record who we feel we can trust and who have a commercialized product. Sometimes that aligns with the sectors. Sometimes we find it falls outside of the target sectors. I think more often what we're looking for is particular themes rather than sectors. And actually, AI and machine learning is an interesting one. Because AI and machine learning, when we see it, when we actually see companies coming to pitch us, it's relatively rudimentary. So there's, no, there's nothing near the level of sophistication that Callum was talking about. But companies are starting to embrace this. And what it means is that the capital efficiency is improved in the businesses that we're looking at. So it's more likely that we would be looking for a theme across multiple sectors than specifically focusing on a given sector. Um, in terms of the VCT regulation changes, I'm not going to talk about this at length because I think we did last year, but um, there haven't been significant impacts on us. I think one of the things that we do note, we have an inability to support some of the portfolio companies, which is obviously frustrating for us, but it's a, few, it's a small number of companies, and for the businesses doing well, they aren't having an issue continue finding funding or even becoming self-funding. But it is something we have to be aware of. Um, but I'd say on the deal flow side, deal flow is stronger than ever, and we haven't found that to be an inhibitor. Um, I guess overall impact on investment strategy, there isn't a significant change in our investment strategy. We're still growth cap investors, and we're still looking for established management teams and commercialized products. But we do see um, an increased amount of syndication also um, partnering with corporate venturing arms. So talking about deals and how we find deals. This is a ridiculously complicated slide, and I'm going to try and talk through it relatively simply. But I just wanted to explain where we find the deals and then our process for filtering those deals out and how a deal ultimately gets to be done. So we start here with the origin of new opportunities. Um, about half of our deals come from traditional professional introducers, like corporate finance houses and accountants. 30% comes direct, and direct doesn't necessarily mean the company approaching us. It could mean um, other non-execs or other entrepreneurs we don't know making the introduction, or often, actually, they come from you guys. So thank you very much. Um, and then the last bucket, which is increasing, is other private equity and venture. And this, this goes hand in hand with syndication, where we're looking to work with other private equity firms. So if we look at then the process, so that's where our deals come from. And I've got rough stats from 2015 across the top of the page here. But if we look at how the deals flow and um, the steps in our own process. So we see more than 800 deals, but about 800 of them are credible enough to run a quick check on, where we say, is there revenue? Can we see the growth? Is there a solid management team? And is the geography appropriate for us? If that's true, about half of those qualify to go onto the deal flow sheet, where we introduce it on a weekly basis, share an overview of the business, and begin our um, relatively high-level due diligence. The, uh, another 100 of the 400 end up going into proper due diligence, internal due diligence for us, where we're really checking the quality of the team and the plans. We're doing deep dives on their historic and forward financials. We're working on more information on the market and competition. We then have an internal checkpoint that we call a fast forward, which is a roughly five to 10 page paper that explains our initial investment thesis and gives an overview of the market and the business. That's discussed and um, uh, bantered by the investment committee. At the same time, we also invite the management team in to present to the entire IC. This is the first investment committee checkpoint where everyone says either yes, we want to spend more time on it or we don't. So. Um, of those, about 12 end up going into let's agree terms with the business and then start doing um, more formal diligence, continued customer meetings, or continued meetings and referencing and deep dives on the business. By this time, we should, we should more or less know that we want to do this deal, because if we're spending that time on it, we should know that we want to do that deal. Roughly 10 of them get to the investment paper stage, which is our 20-page, 25-page paper that outlines the entire deal and the scope of um, the market, the business, the competition. We then have quite a um, lively discussion through the investment committee about whether we want to proceed with the deal or not. 
generally, by the time it's got to investment paper stages, we do want to proceed with it. There's maybe one or two that fall off in that process. Once we've agreed it, we then move into the formal third party due diligence, which is our last uh, formal step in the process, where we have uh, accountants and lawyers come in and do financial and legal due diligence. We'll use, if we believe we need to, we'll use external technology consultants to do tech DD and other forms of DD. And then we move to closing once the VCT clearance has been attained. So that's roughly the, the, the process that we go through, starting with 1,000 to 800 and ending up with eight. Um, how do we make sure that we're seeing every deal in the market? And actually, when we go through our weekly, um, our internal meetings on a weekly basis, we look at all the deals that have been done in the market, and we go through them to make sure that we've seen them. And what we're looking for is kind of that hit rate. Have we seen all these deals, which means we have the option of either deciding to do that deal or not doing that deal. But the important thing is that we've seen it. And we are seeing that number going up significantly. Some of the things that we're doing to try and make sure we're improving that, hiring, we've doubled the size of the team in the last 18 months, and hopefully you'll have a chance to meet some of the team here. Um, we seem to be consistently um, hiring backgrounds from um, Harvard Business School, Goldman Sachs, and McKinsey, so you might see some themes running there, but we've got a, a fantastic team. Building our market profile, we've actually, the larger team has allowed us to make sure that we're present at a lot more events, and we've doubled the attendance at industry events and conferences this year. Um, we've had, you just saw the award nominations. We've had a record number of award nominations this year. We've hired a specialist uh, a VCPR firm who's got us involved with Silicon Valley comes to the UK, Sadiq Khan's Go to Grow platform, um, and the Duke of York's Pitch at Palace events. Um, and we're continuing to look harder, um, which means looking at unusual sources. So a lot more of working our own networks quite hard and making sure we're at all of the industry events. And then lastly, I talked about syndicating before. We're finding our peers to be a good source. Um, in 2012, none of our deals were syndicated. In 2016, 80% of the deals were syndicated with some other form of um, finance here. I'm just going to talk briefly about some of the new investments that we've made this year. So in the video, hopefully you saw some old favorites as well as some of our new investments. Um, a couple of the ones that have been announced, so Thread and online's, Online Men's Personal Stylist, please do sign up and take a look. We'd love your feedback. Um, Contact Engine, a communication technology firm um, that's used by large businesses to communicate on a regular basis with their customers. Honeycomb TV is a video advertising platform. It's a B2B business. Um, POC, which is mobile app commerce, develops white label mobile apps and then resells them to people like Misguided. Um, there is a bit of a common theme in here in that all of these businesses in some way, shape or form are taking advantage of artificial intelligence and machine learning. And I talked about it's relatively rudimentary at the levels that we see it and that is true. But if I give a couple of examples on the apparel side, so Thread will work to predict the things that you might be likely to return. So when you put it in your basket to check out, they'll say, do you always return skinny jeans or do you hate everything that's blue? And instead make a recommendation to say, maybe you'd like these jeans or maybe you want to try this in red. Um, POC allows the um, branded um, customers to do things like when you come back to the app to take a look at whatever the new apparel available is, They'll, um, the first page that you see is going to be things that are resembling things that you've bought before. So this is light years away from what Callum was talking about, but it still shows it's still a greater level of efficiency. And what we can see is that the sales and the sell through is much faster with these businesses than it would have been with their um, predecessors five, 10 years ago. Um, I just wanted to do a little bit of a wrap up talking about the portfolio generally and some of the milestones that we've seen across the portfolio. So if I start, um, Bliss, which has been a bit of an old favorite, we've, we've had this business for a little while and it's been doing phenomenally in the past few years. They just closed a $25 million raise that was led by US investors at um, a valuation that was 30 times our initial entry valuation. So obviously we need to next get to an exit, but this business has, has come on quite a bit. Um, Watchfinder, which we'll be talking shortly, but um, have hit a $100 million pound run rate. In Context Solutions, which does um, 3D virtual reality shopping simulations, received a $15 million investment this year that was led by Intel in the US, Intel Capital. SimpleStream and TV Player have received um, a 15, also 15, no, $8 million round that was led by A&E Networks, which is a large US broadcaster. Um, D3O, 
um, has led a partnership with Usain Bolt, to, um, who is basically their advocate of some of their running shoe technology, and that's had a significant impact on revenues. Monica, oh, sorry, um, Pac has doubled the monthly revenues. The Pac business we just mentioned has doubled monthly revenues in the four months since our investment. Um, Perfect Channel has won a contract to manage Euronext uh, debt collateral trading, collateral debt trading, sorry. Um, Network Locum acquired R Locums. Uh, Monica Venator is opening their first New York store in December, so please go check it out if you happen to be there. Um, and Thread revenues are up four and a half times on previous year. So these are some of the milestones the portfolio have achieved this year. One of the most common questions we're asked is, does anything ever go wrong? And there's a very simple answer. Um, I'm going to transition to my colleague Maria, who's going to talk about an example of where things have gone wrong. But I just wanted to preface it by saying part of the reason we don't talk about it quite as often. One is the stage of our investment, growth capital, means that for us, when things don't go right, it's highly unlikely that a business just goes bust or we write it off entirely. What's more likely is that we don't meet the growth projections we wanted to, and we end up holding the business for a while, or we can't find an appropriate exit. In that case, it doesn't make sense for us to be talking about a business in a negative sense, because it's still a trading business, and it's still a business that may well turn around and, and be one of our better investments. So we tend not to focus on anything negative as it involves current trading businesses. Um, but I will hand over to Maria, who is going to give an example of a recently exited business and talk about some of the challenges there. 